All right, so let's get into this, the truth about the purpose of prayer. So the purpose of prayer is simply you requesting God to get involved. Hello? Folks, you don't go into somebody's house without them asking you to come in. Hello? And we can't, God, now God has limited himself. Now he's not limited, but only what he limits himself. He limited himself by our invitation. You want me? I'll come. I want you, but you have to want me. I want you, but will you want me? And do you want me to help you when you're being frustrated? Do you want me to wipe your tears away? Then make me feel welcome each and every day. All right, so the purpose of prayer. Amen. This morning we're going to get into a series on prayer. Now this is the truth about we're going to take about four weeks delving in how to accurately pray right and give you examples of your equipment in prayer. Many, many people are, are taught that the, they should do five steps. And once they do the five steps, things are going to turn out all right. That's psychology. What you need to know is what you have, how to use it, how to apply it. Can you say amen? And let God do the work. But you're not going to get that from religion. Religion's going to say, keep on trying, keep on trying. And if you hold on long enough, you're going to be saved. Sounds real draining, doesn't it? Amen. So we're going back. So if you go with me, take your Bible and go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 to 12. Okay. Now, again, let me set the stage. God is desiring relationship with us. Remember? Our children have been stolen away. And more than anything, he has sent his son to gather us up. And it's based on one thing, whether or not we choose him, whether or not we want him. Okay? How many here want more of God? And then you got the idea. Our prayer now in the New Testament is different than the Old Testament. How many know it's so? Can you tell me why it's different? Prayer in the New Testament is different than the Old Testament because in the New Testament, Jesus said, in the day that I go home to be with the Father, that resurrection time, you will no longer ask me anything. Whatever you, though, ask the Father in my name, he will do it for you, it says. I'll give you the scripture here in a minute. So in the Old Testament, we get the prophet Daniel. He beseeched the Lord in fasting and praying. It took 21 days for the angel of the Lord to bring him the message. Now, God heard the prayer the moment he started praying. But it took the battling into the atmosphere to bring that answer. But folks, that's Old Testament. Yes. Go ahead. Jesus died and rose again and kicked the devil's face in. Put him in his place and only allows him to tempt you because God wants you. But he knows that you must have a fair choice. So he says, I've set before you life and death. Therefore, you choose life. Good suggestion, God. Thank you. <laughs> that you and your seed, our offspring, may live. So God is desiring, but it has to do with us desiring him. Someone say amen. amen. So in the New Testament, our prayer is, Father, in Jesus' name. Boom. You're right in the throne. It says, that day come boldly before the throne of grace. Amen. What day? The day that Jesus sits at the right end of the Father. Father, Peggy's coming up. Woo! Okay, Peggy, what do you want? Amen. What do you need, Peggy? Go ahead. And now, see, here's what the deal. We, we look at God generally, but we forget to look at him specifically how he deals with us personally. Because you're his child. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. And he's excited about you having a relationship with him. But you can't allow yourself to be distracted or forget. Because most of us suffer with distraction and forgetfulness. It's not, it's not that we don't pray. 
is we forget to. And then we get a reminder. You ever notice that? You ever got a late notice on your bills? You know you get a reminder when you don't pray? Do you know what that reminder is? Flesh. Crabbiness. Irritableness. Don't smile at me that way. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's go on. So you in 1 Peter, I want to show you how much God loves you. Say, I am, I am. in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. Righteous. righteous. Only because the righteous one lives in me. Now you did ask Jesus to come into your heart, didn't you? Well, then you fit. So listen to the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion one for another. Love as brethren. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Everyone say amen. amen. All right, verse 9 says, Not returning evil for evil. Well, I'll get even. Or reviling for reviling. You call me name, I'll call you too. Hello? But the contrary. Blessing, knowing that you were called to be a blessing. Can you say amen? So look at your neighbor next to you. says, I might not know you, but bless you. We're made to bless and not to curse. So be careful who you bless. Moving right along. Catch this. Verse 10 says, For he would, he who would live, love life. How many here love life? Now we already talked about last week the difference between the world system and the earth. The earth is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. But the system that Satan set up is evil. It promises you all kinds of things but gives you nothing. It's an alternative to the truth. That's all he has. He doesn't have any truth. So you're either going to pay attention to God or pay attention to him. Or you're going to play the fence. You know what? Everybody smile at me. Old, old joke. Don't play the fence. Don't sit on the fence. Can you say amen? Either get in with God. He's not going to take your fun away. He's going to make it better. But don't, don't play the world either. If you, how many has ever been to Las Vegas? Reno? How about Laughlin? I passed through. I, I'm not a gambler. Life is a gamble as it is. I have gambled, but I don't do it anymore. I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, what's the closest thing to a description of how the world system is set up? And God said, he actually said this to me. I'm, I'm praying, just an innocent little child of God praying and God says you've been to Vegas haven't you he says yeah he says that's all set up on the world system you play it you might win most of the time it leans towards the house this is Satan's house right now God's going to get it totally back during the millennium and after so but right now there's a spiritual outlaw in here lying to everybody turn on the news maybe turn it off <laughs> Amen. The world thinks they have the answer. You can't even watch a commercial without homosexuality and all that junk going on in there. Now, this is the end times. You think it's so strange that we see this stuff? All right. What is the thing that God told all of us some over three or four years ago? He said this again. I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll try to repeat it. Eyes off the world. Because the world is passing away. Eyes off of other people, even myself. Don't put your eyes on me. I'm not your savior. But I speak words of him. You're not my savior either, but you speak, can speak words of him. Right? So eyes off of people because we do fail and we are frail and we make mistakes. So listen, if somebody makes a mistake, it shouldn't threaten you. Eyes off of people. If you will practice this and ask God to really, really help you, two-thirds of your problems will go away. Because it's with your eyes and with your ears you're attempted. Seldom with your nose and mouth. 
and touch. You still with me? Eyes off the people, and then the one that really wipes people out. I see them years and years never grow because their eyes are on themselves. Folks, there are two kinds of pride in a human being. The positive pride, I'm a macho man, which is extreme. And then the one that everybody doesn't know what to deal with, which is the most dangerous satanic one, and that is depression. Because a person who suffers with depression, if it's not chemical, means that you are focused on yourself, and when things aren't working out for you, you will be depressed. See, your eyes are not on Jesus. They're on who? Yes. And when we sit there and think about how we feel, and nobody likes me, and oh, I'm just this, and I'm in that, and Satan just dumps it right on you. One thing, the bird flies over your head. How many have birds fly over your head? But don't let them make a nest in your head, in your hair, right? People who dwell on the negative, on the lies, and all of this kind of stuff, even when they can't do anything but pray, you'll bring yourself down to depression because your eyes are not on the Lord. They're on yourself. God help us with that, right? I mean, that's not a... That's what God said to me. I said, God, I need a message that will never change, that will help people. And will be a message that I didn't think of. It was something you want them to know. And he says, eyes off the world, eyes off of people, eyes off of yourself, and put them on me because I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. You keep your eyes, because if your eyes are on me for the joy that's set before you, you will endure whatever comes your way. Because your eyes are on Jesus. He never changes, not any day. He's the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Yes, and he lives in you. Yes. Oh, happy day. <clears throat> well, Christians, you get up this morning. Who was the first person you said hi to? I hope it was God. If it's not, make that adjustment. You'll find your day go better. All right, let's go on. Are you still with me? If you desire to live long life and see good days, how many do? All right. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now listen to this. What We're talking about prayer today. God's purpose in prayer. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Everyone say, that's me, because Jesus lives in me. Now, folks, just for those that know, I, I believe in the Trinity, or I don't like the word, but the Godhead. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But when you talk about Jesus, the Father wants to know what you're doing with Jesus. He's the one you're to pal around with by the help of the Holy Spirit. And when you stand before the Lord, the Father's going to say, what would you do with my son? Now, he knows. Did you know that God asks you questions periodically and through the Bible he asks people's questions. You know why? Is it, be, is it because he doesn't know? Like for example, Adam, where are you? <laughs> Have you eaten of the... I mean, he knew. Why was he doing that? He was trying to get Adam to think about what he did. Yes. Where are you? Yes. What are you saying about yourself? Oh, I'm an idiot. Right? I had to do it like that so you can get some humor out of it. Yeah, part of you is an idiot. It's called your flesh. Stop walking around in it. If you liked it so much, why do you bathe it? Why do you wash its face? Why do you put makeup on it? You do that to hide the flesh. What was Adam and Eve doing in the bushes when God says, where are you? Folks, when it's church time, don't hide in the bushes. Come to church. You're always going to get an encouragement, should always get an encouragement at church to be built up. So, all right. So, say, God's eyes are over the righteous. Say it with me. And his ears are always open to my prayers. 
Okay, now you know God wants you to pray. Well, doesn't he know what we have need of? Here's the dumb thing. Yeah, but you have not because you ask not. So God has limited himself and because of the evil one on this planet saying they have to call on you, God. But what the scripture says, as many call upon the name of the Lord shall be. Yeah. So Satan's got a whole game going. He's got a whole game going with people, even Christians. Playing games with you. In fact, well, I'm going to do a series called Kicking Over the Sacred Cows. A lot of Christians have a, what, a, all kinds of sacred cows they hold on to thinking it's the truth. And it's stumbling you. For example, you cannot practice the Old Testament in the New Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. But the moment you start practicing the law, you're going to fall from grace. And you're going to get frustrated and sick. Mixing the two... Don't work. Because if the Old Testament was perfect, a new one would never have been sought and established. So I'm not saying throw away the Old Testament. Please. Embrace it. Learn from their mistakes. But certainly don't practice the same boo-boos. Can you say amen? We got a whole bunch of Christians who are bored with Christianity. So now they're becoming Jewish people. What's dumb with that? If you weren't born a Jew, you're not a Jew. Can you say amen? And I love Jewish people. I'm as close as to being a Jew right now, as, and so are you, in being born again. Because if we are to be Christ, then it says we are Abraham's seed. Heirs according to the promise. So guess what? When God promised Abraham, he says, your seed's going to be like the sand of the sea, natural Jewish people. Yeah. And the stars of the sky, born again believers. Thank God for Father Abraham. Yes. Father Abraham had many sons. <laughs> I can see some of you have been to camp. All right. Amen. Are you enjoying this? Let's get into this. Okay, now we're, we're talking about how powerful God is and how desirable he wants to help. Can you say amen? Here's some thoughts. Number one, start your day out with God. God first, family second, job third, ministry fourth. Just like that. Get it out of line, you're going to fail. God first. God's broken down in time in prayer, time in praise, time in the word, time in church. If you're skipping church, not reading the word, guess what? You missed your first priority. Everything else is going to crumble. Say I got it. Don't look at me like I'm, I'm trying to tell you what to do and I've got it down. I do have to do these things too. Amen. So, let's, let's move on to my second point. Throughout our life, we read and we desire to focus on something that gives us in the answer. And we know it's Jesus now, right? And because we are like a Polaroid camera. Remember those? Jesus! How many ever hit the button when you weren't pointing at the right thing? Oh, no. Amen. Your kid finds the camera, comes in while you're showering. You know, God forbid, kid, get away from me. Amen. I had, I had children. My children were great. They had all kinds of senses of humor. My son. Well, we'll talk about that later. Thirdly, we will either focus on Jesus, folks. Or the many negative distractions that the world sends us. Amen. And folks, we need to understand who we are as a Christian. How we're set up. How the kingdom of God is set up. So we can work with the plan. Stan. Alright, so. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4, please. Let me show you something. Everything will turn out better. And you'll receive guidance if you do this. And everything gets, get God's advice. How many of you ever bought a car and you wish you didn't? And then some of us have got one that you wish, thank God. Amen. Let me make it into something funny. How many of you ever got a husband and wish you didn't? <laughs> Sorry. It's the truth. We need God's guidance. Can you say amen? 
I mean, your lives are important. Your family is important. What you do and say is very important. So our relationship with God has got to be primo. It's got to be the best that we can make it. And listen, you're always going to fall short, but God's going to make up what you fall short in. But you've got to get started in it. Somebody said to me, I just can't keep thinking about myself. I said, why don't you stop? What an idea. Hey, you want to see how, how simple things are and how Satan lies about it? How many ever worried about something? And you wish your mind would stop like at night? You know how to get your mind to stop? Open your mouth and say something. Your mind will literally stop and listen to what your mouth said. You don't believe me, do you? Nah, 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 nah. I'm going to show you here right now. You ready? Everybody close their eyes. Okay, now just listen to how I instruct you because I want you to experience this. This is what you do when your mind is running away with you. You talk. Okay? To get its attention. So slowly count from one to five. Real slow and I'm going to interrupt you. Don't do it now. And ask you to speak out loud your name. Okay. You ready to start? Nod your head. Slowly. One on two under. Say your name. What happened to your counting? It stopped. Your counting just stopped while you heard your name called. Next time you start worrying, next time the enemy puts something on your head, speak, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, man. Satan's mad at me now. He's been oppressing people with that for years. With a turkey lips. I went to God. I'm one of these guys that go to God. I want to know an answer. I said, God, why am I dreaming weird dreams at night? Whacked out, even oppressive dreams. He says, because you don't close the door at night. I said, what do you mean? I'm, you're leaving it open. It's the subconscious mind. It relaxes during the night. And if you don't plead the blood of Jesus over your dreams, the enemy's going to say, ah, we can give Peggy a little booger dream. To know you're sweating, you're breathing hard, you're fighting in, the, in your dream, you can't do anything about it. Why go through that? And, amen. So let's teach you the secrets of prayer. Don't you miss one of this series, okay? All right. Philippians 4, please. Look at verse 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord, what? Why do we rejoice in the Lord always? It keeps you open to hear from Him. So delight yourself in the Lord, doesn't it? So how do you do that? How many here have ever been sad? What'd you do to change that? You changed your thinking. Maybe somebody said something to you. Here's what I do. Sometimes I whistle because I'm happy. I'm a terrible whistler, by the way. But most of the time I whistle to make myself happy. Sometimes I don't feel like laughing. But most of the time I imagine the enemy getting kicked by Jesus and I don't have a problem laughing. The idea is your mind is your tool. It is not to run away with you. Don't lose your control of your thinking. Can you answer a a question right away? Or do you go off and just some kind of answer? Remember the man at the pool of Bethesda? Jesus said, do you want to be healed? What was his answer? Gosh, I have no man to put me in the pool. Jesus says, take up your bed and go home. Shut that up. Now I'm trying to be humorous about it. Jesus was never like that. But I think the point got across because that man had been sitting there for years and every time he'd get ready to get his healing, some selfish person would jump into the pool. So what he was doing when Jesus asked him is he was complaining. Folks, don't talk about what you can't. Talk about what God can. Someone say amen. amen. Boy, you guys asleep? Don't let the devil put you to sleep. Okay, I know I have a monotone voice, but 
All right. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He's right here with us. He's in your heart. Be anxious for nothing. What? Anxiety opens the door to stress. Stress opens the doors to mess. And mess opens the door to unrest. When Jesus said, come unto me, give me your cares, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn my ways, not your own. Amen. I know I put a little amplified in there. Okay, so let's go on. Says, he says, now, this is, this is the key. Look at this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. What? What? You're going to go on a vacation? Pray. Ask God's favor on it. You're going to take some medicine? Pray and see if you should. We forget the most basic thing. You gave your life to God. Seek his guidance and counsel on every major decision you make. When you do that, here's the results. This is the Bible now. This is your results. And the peace of God, which surpasses all your understanding. In other words, you can't stuff it into your brain. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Wouldn't it be better to have that than run to jump into something and have after effects? Somebody says, well, well, Carrie, you've been to the school of hard knocks? Yes, I have. And I'm still in part of the school of hard knocks. And I'm in the school of the Holy Spirit too, right? My flesh, I'm in the world. In my spirit, I'm with God. And depending on which one I listen to and how, how much joy I will have. You see, because if we don't walk in the spirit, then we will fulfill the lusts of our flesh. But if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh doesn't like the spirit. And the spirit doesn't like the flesh. These are contrary. So you cannot do the things you wish. But if you be led of the spirit. So we live now from God out. See, when I lived before I met God, I lived from the outside in. Holding myself in bondage. But now that I met Christ and I walk with him. I'm living from the inside out. Right? How many has ever heard the word feelings? Is that outside or inside? In, you don't have feelings that's corrupted in your soul and spirit. You have corrupted feelings in your flesh. You didn't say hi to me. You hurt my feelings. Could you imagine what Satan will do with somebody like that? Yeah. Your feelings will be hurt all day long. Yeah. Somebody that won't get out of themselves. They'll sit in a sermon like this. And if I mention anything about them being stubborn or anything. They're going to think that the whole sermon's on them. Now if you've never been that way in a church. Please don't blame the pastor. Because if you haven't dealt with yourself first thing in prayer before you came to church, sometimes you're going to feel picked on at church. I don't want you to feel picked on here. I want you to feel encouraged to give you words of wisdom that you can apply in your daily life so that your life will be good. And then when we get together in heaven, we'll all sit around in this great lamb supper of life and talk about how we listen to God. And to each other about God. And how, thank God, we didn't listen to the other dude. Right? I'm trying to relate to us in a more of a human way, less religious. Indubitably. I have a lot of education. I have a lot of degrees. You can call me Dr. Fahrenheit. PhDs, DBs, you know, friends of the NSA, blah, blah, blah. You know, who am I? I'm a little teeny child of God that just loves Jesus. 
And God had other plans with me. He says, okay, son, now you have accepted me. Would you like to know my will for your life? <laughs> sure I would. All right, let's go on. A couple of points. The wisdom of God says to us, would you understand my ways so I can get you out of here? How many know the Lord's coming back and is going to receive us unto himself, right? If you're not yoked with them, you might not go. Now, I'm not saying that you won't and I'm not going to make a doctrine, you know, that you won't. But listen, if you have any doubts, make sure you, <laughs> you get that taken care of. Can you say amen? Second of all, to become anxious about something means you have to dwell on it. There are a lot of things that you as an individual can't deal with right away. You get a surprise bill. It says, deal with me. What do you do? You take the bill and you and God go pray. Amen. Say, Lord, I can't change any of this. I can pay it, but I have to do it. So I'm asking for your wisdom and your favor on this. Now you've done it right. You've done it right. And then you take the care of it. And you give it back to God. You don't become irresponsible because God will begin to supply your need. So I know there's a lot of Christians. One person said this to me. And a lot of Christians talk a good talk, but they don't walk a good walk. Folks, don't hang around people like that. You know, people that always have to tell you how they are, usually aren't. There's a whole world full of that. You need to sail on sailor till you find what it is you're looking for. Turn your ship around, headed for the Lord. And so many things that you do, we could bring God inside a little more. So let's teach you how to do it. All right, last point I want to make there is the time with God in prayer will diminish the stress and the lies that Satan tries to sell you. Yeah. Meet with them first time every morning. Don't have to be long. We imagine I'm meeting with God. How long did you stay? I stayed a couple hours. Oh, you can't do that all the time. Spend 10 to 15 minutes at the most, maybe five minutes. Greet him. Make him know he's the best thing that ever existed. That you want everything that have to do. And get yourself soaked into God. Yeah. And then get up and go through your day. We need God's guidance on everything. You're in a fallen planet full of fallen lies. And people, bless their hearts, not everybody has your best interest. When you pray. My next point is when you pray, not if you pray. The Bible doesn't say when you pray. It doesn't say if you pray. Okay, Matthew, listen to this. I'm going to read two scriptures. Matthew 5. Verse 6, and then Psalms 91, 1 and 2. We're going to emphasize something to you. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But there's a place in God that you can go, Satan can't go. Hello? Amen. Did you know Satan can't follow you into your prayer room? Go ahead. Did you know Satan can't listen to your prayers if you pray right? Amen. Hello? Yeah. Some people believe, well, I'm praying. But that's the reason why the enemy's tempting me that way. Because he heard my prayers. Boy, you sure are not educated. Okay, so let's go through this. Now, I'm not asking you to believe what I tell you. I'm asking you to search the scripture. Because I do believe what Jesus did was perfect. What God did for us and is doing now in the earth by the help of the Holy Spirit is perfect. Your protection, your care is perfect. Well, why do we have such a bad time sometimes? Because you're not under God's care. You're under yours at that time. You've taken matters in your own hand. Thank God it wasn't anything bad. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> All right, Matthew 5, 6. You know the scripture. But when you pray, didn't say if you pray. 
But when you pray, every day, everyone say, every day. Go into your room. In other words, get away from people. Go in and be personal with God. Okay, that's what he's saying there. Maybe it's the toiletries. Maybe it's your closet. Maybe it's your car. Make it your prayer closet where you and God meet. Can you say amen? Where you're not so distracted. And it says, listen to me, and close the door. Pray to your father where? In the secret place. The secret place. Now, I want to ask you this. God's got a sense of humor. What does he mean by secret? Secret from who? There you go. You see, most Christians don't know that. When you go into the secret place, you disappear. Satan's going, where did he go? Where did she go? She went into Jesus. Doesn't the Bible say we're in Christ? Look at me. We're, we're in this church, right? You're not outside in your car. Where are you? Well, so when the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, where are you? And you're in the world too at the same time. Which one are you paying attention to? Bang. Yeah. So listen to this. This is, this is really something. You're in a secret place. Satan can't go. He can't listen. Well, how do you get that secret place? You go, everyone do this with a father in Jesus name. You disappear, you move into Christ. Now, you could see yourself. People could see you. you don't, you're not anything different. But Satan is blinded in such a way he could only see where you are, where you're not. And when you say Father in Jesus' name, literally you're shrouded with Christ. You're literally shrouded with him. So Satan sees you at one moment. And when you say Father in Jesus' name, you disappear. And he sees Jesus. And he goes, oh, oh. Let me see if they're really in Christ. Let me make a suggestion. Hey, dummy. Oh, that's them. <laughs> Every man is tempted. Pay attention. When he's drawn away. Of his own lust or desires. Drawn away from what? Your relationship in God that you started off during the day. Hello. Amen. So, folks, the secret place is a place you can go, Satan cannot. Now, folks, that secret place also has the presence of God in because God's there, right? Now, where God is, can sickness dwell? So maybe with a little more exposure to God will make us feel better. Hello? Have a seat, brother. You're on camera. Wave to the audience. Okay. All right, so, the secret place. Now listen. But when you go into the secret place, now Psalms 91. How many here love that psalm? It's what we call the protection psalm. That psalm God gave to David to see who he was in Christ that was to come. God says, you still be a man after my own heart. But in the New Testament, we're going to show you what's really going to reign. And he says in Psalms 91, verse 1 and 2. He who dwells, say the way or dwell, in the secret place. What's the secret place? The place where Satan can't go. If you dwell there long enough, you'll abide under what? The shadow of the most or almighty God, right? Now you think about the shadow of. Shadow means influence in the Hebrew. You dwell long enough with God, you'll be under God's influence. And woe be to the devil that tries to mess with you. Now, if you don't go into the secret place, if you don't charge up in your day, Satan loves to mess with you. He'll say something. Oh, that little lady will pull out in front of you in the parking lot. And she'll drive on. Don't even know you exist. And you're a human. You know? 
real spiritual. <laughs> Thank God you're by yourself. Oh, but you're not. You're with God. All right, now I'm meddling in with you a little bit. So let's look at this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the influence of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord. This is him saying where he's at. The Lord is my refuge, my fortress. Yes. Do you say that about God? When you get up from your prayer morning with him, do you get up in the fortress? Yes, yes you do. But you've got to declare it. You weren't really born again until you declared Jesus being Lord. You want to know why that thief on the cross got saved and went to paradise? He says, remember me, acknowledge Messiah. God is looking out on this planet and he's saying, will you acknowledge me? Will you want me? Let me work with you. Don't listen to the turkey lips. Which is everywhere, by the way. You should be able to discern his lies from the truth. Every good, perfect gift comes from God. Everything that's not good and perfect comes from the other. Somehow. He might bring it to you through a relative. God forbid. All right. Matthew uh, 7, please. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Amen. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. People don't really understand a lot of this. So I'm going to, what does it mean to ask and you shall receive? Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. But the Greek says, ask, keep on asking. Okay. Knock, keep on knocking. But the Bible also says, when you ask, believe you receive it, you shall what? Have it. So here's the problem. Do I ask for it? And keep every time asking for it? Or what does it mean? I'm glad you asked that question. When you ask for something, you believe you receive it, it's on its way. Now don't stop. Ask for something more. For heaven's sakes. Come on, keep asking. You're the one that's without. Well, it might be selfish if I ask. Well, you'll know if it's selfish or not. Don't you? You're at least that immature. You are. Yes, you are. So when you sit there and you ask and you believe you receive it, boom, there it is. You don't see it physically yet, but boom. You don't keep on asking for it. If I have a dog biting my leg, I don't call the dog. Here, dog, here, dog. (coughs) Folks, quit calling the problem the problem. Everyone knows it. Call the problem answerer. Almost done with you. Amen. Who is the friend at midnight? Remember, remember, remember it says, which of you having a friend that came at midnight? And it says, I'm just going to paraphrase because we're running out of time. Remember, and it says that you go to a friend at midnight and it says, you've had another friend. I'm paraphrasing. And he went to the man, his friend at midnight, he says, well, would you rise up and give me three loaves? I'm not prepared for my other friend to come. And it says that the friend he says, leave me alone. I'm asleep with my children. I'm comfortable. Leave me alone. How many remember the story? Who is the friend? Now, don't, don't answer me right now because I don't think you know. Okay. All right. Friend is actually a positive and negative thought, okay? So let's find out. Now, how many has ever made friends with your flesh? You do every day. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You have to carry your flesh around, right? So the first thing you do is get up, you get ready and pray and you do all that. And then you, you hope you got your body going along with you so you can drive your car. I mean, you see what I'm saying? So we have to befriend our instruments, right? That's your friend at midnight. How many would ever come to you and call you on the prayer line and say, I'm going to use you, Peggy, again. Peggy, can you get up and pray with me? Oh, no, I'm in bed. I'm with my kids. Well, your kids are grown. What are you telling me that for? 
you know. We could hear the excuse. How many's had a desire to really follow the Lord, but you had every kind of excuse that your friends, your flesh, tried to talk you out of. Say, oh me. So the friend at midnight is your flesh. In order to get your flesh going with God, you got to be persistent. He's not talking about Jesus. Everybody say, who's the friend at midnight? It's not Jesus. Because Jesus is right, Johnny, on the spot to minister your need. You don't have to get him up. He never sleeps. It's your flesh that gets comfortable and kind of lays around. And then when an urgent thing like you're sick or, or somebody else has hurts, your flesh says, nah, I don't want to, oh, I'll pray about it tomorrow. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. How are you going to change that friend at midnight? By being persistent. Say amen, somebody. Amen. All right. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on persisting. Because your flesh will come in line. You want to lose weight? Stop going on a diet. Stop thinking about losing weight. Ask God to help you and tell you how to eat. Then obey him. How did I lose 150 pounds? By that exact thing. Did it take a long time? Yes. Because I wanted to have my steak and eat it too. Hello? Amen. I must say I have gained 12 pounds. You're fattening me up. All right. So. We got one more thing I'm going to give you. Remember the two, the, the, the woman and the unjust judge? The unjust judge. Remember the parable of the unjust judge? We're going to go there. Would you like to go there with me? Let's read this together. All right. In Luke 18, please. The Holy Spirit just said this to me. Listen, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying. Go check it out. And don't, listen, you ever notice there are some people who just like to argue? Okay. Just stop them sometime and say, why are you arguing? Well, I said, what's your point you're trying to make? Always ask them this. So you're trying to tell me you rather believe God isn't that way than believe that he is? See, people who argue never play out their argument. Play out your argument before you open your mouth and insert foot. Amen. Play out the argument in, with God. <clears throat> All right, Luke 18. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to give up. Amen. What do we need to be doing? Pray. Why do we need to be praying? Because we need God's help. How often do we need God's help? Every day, all day long. So you're to be instant in prayer. You're to be praying without ceasing. Prayer only ta takes a minute. God, I don't know what to do about that situation. It's yours. Sometimes a prayer is just like that. Sometimes a prayer is, oh, God, help. Without the request, God cannot come. Let me pick on you really heavy duty. You mind prayers. Yeah, I'm praying. I don't hear a thing. I'm going to pick on you for a minute because this is a deception of Satan. You can pray in your mind. God can hear you. Satan can't. Satan cannot read your mind. God can. But God said when you pray, the word prayer itself tells us it means to ask. Asking means words. Out of mouth. So, you're not going to think yourself happy. You didn't think Jesus into your heart. What makes you think you can battle with your mind? That's a deception. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't hear your thoughts. Because when I pray, I pray and do all my things. And then I sit and meditate with God. And God brings me other things up in my mind. And I call it meditational prayer. These things float up. 
And all of a sudden, pray out loud with it. How did you get God in your heart? You believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth. How do you get better during the day? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. How do you get healed? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Hold fast the confession of your faith without wavering. For he is faithful. Having done the promises, you will receive the blessings. What's coming out of your mouth? Now listen to people. I'm a people watcher, people listener. I sit back and listen to people babble, talk. And it's okay, it's good. But right out of there somewhere, some kind of left field thing is teaching their kids how to do wrong things. And they haven't even thought it through yet. We need to sit down and get the wisdom from above, which is pure, peaceable, easy to be treated, and full of good fruits. All right, the unjust judge. Okay, saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Okay, so number one, it can't be the devil because the devil does fear God. Believe it or not, he's scared to death of him. He's trying to sell you he's not, but he, he is. He's already put a sentence on Satan's head. You're going to be dead here shortly. So he's busy trying to take as many people with him as he can. Are you with me? Now this judge didn't regard God and he didn't regard man. So this judge is pretty weird. Could this judge be something more than a person? Yes. Remember we have the little widow? She kept coming to the unjust justice. Avenge me of my adversary, she'd say. But the judge would not. But because of her continual coming. And he says, well, because she's going to constantly bother me. Then he decides he's going to judge. So number one, the unjust judge is not the devil. The unjust judge is not God. How many know he's just? The unjust just is life. It's life in this planet. It neither regards God. Nor does it regard man. Life can bless you or life could curse you. It's like fire. You throw fire in a fireplace, you can get warm. Throw fire in the middle of your living room, burn your house down. Life doesn't recognize anything until it's put in it. So you bring God into life, the unjust judge. And you get out of life what God promises you. Don't you let that unjust judge life tell you you'll never amount to anything. And this is the way you have to live. Come on now. You should have got something wonderful from that. Not because of me. Because I studied, studied, and studied. I said, Lord, that unjust judge. See, Satan can't cast you to hell, folks. You have to uh, agree. And God can't throw you into hell because he didn't put anybody there. We throw our own self into hell by not following God, by following the other. Go ahead. Come on now. Yeah. So what should we do, Pastor Carey? We should be men and women of prayer. Yeah. We should realize prayer is not a task or a labor. It's a joy. You got to rechange your thinking about meeting with God because number one, He's all about you. Yeah. Relax when you're in His presence. Open up, laugh, cry. When's the last time you just wept before the Lord? If you're not weeping now, you're not in the right place with God yet. Why would you say that? Because we're about ready to go home. Yeah. And there's still a lot of your flesh hanging around. You don't believe me? Let me insult you. Let's see what you do with it. Sometimes I like to poke somebody, especially they're running around. I like to pop their head a little bit. Listen, in this house, you obey God. In your house, you obey God. In this country, we obey God. Can you say amen? And we'll be that standard 
a believer. If you got something out of that this morning, we give the Lord praise.